We'll give it a, oh, there we go, it's clicked over. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today titled Going Global, Australian FinTech Businesses on the Rise in Europe. My name is Annika Barton. I'm Austrade's Trade and Investment Commissioner um, covering the Netherlands market. Uh, don't worry, the, the webinar today will, will speak quite heavily about the Netherlands, but also uh, about the broader opportunity and the broader um, ecosystem across Europe. Um, the format for today will be a short introductory session from me uh, going through the fintech ecosystem in Europe, and then we will jump straight to the, the best part of the session, which will be some question and answer with our esteemed panel. Um, so today on the panel, I'm joined by three um, experts from across the ecosystem uh, as it relates to international business and international fintech in the Netherlands and in the EU. Brendan Bradley is a partner, at, a partner covering Europe at Seed Capital. Brendan's worked in the financial markets for 35 years, predominantly in the capital market and exchange space. He has used this experience in the last six years to act as board director, investor, and mentor for multiple fintech firms, particularly at the seed stage of development and culminating in recently taking a position to support the development of seed space in Europe. Ian Park is the founder and CEO of Australian company FinPay. Headquartered in Australia with operations in the EU and a number of other markets, Ian has spent his professional life operating in global markets from mining and resources to tech, and prior to FinPay, he founded and successfully exited two other startups. And then Bart Brinkman is our business development manager at Bridge Legal and Finance. He has many years experience in international business and investment promotion into the Netherlands, and now he's been with uh, Bridge for almost four years and has responsible for business development in the Europe Asia Pacific and other countries to bring in international companies considering the Netherlands to use it as their base for EU expansion. Bart and his team provide advice and services to fast track the establishment of entities here in the Netherlands. Okay, Stu is going to drive uh, some slides for me. So he'll gonna pop, he's going to pop them up for about five to eight minutes for the intro session and then we'll flick back uh, to the panel session and you'll be able to see everybody for the question and answer uh, portion of the event. Uh, so if we can move to slide one, thanks, or the next slide, please, Stu. So Europe is emerging as a, fin a leading fintech hub. Since the adoption of the European Commission's fintech action plan in 2018, which was set to integrate Europe's financial markets, Europe has seen a sharp increase of authorizations for payment and electronic money businesses, that is to say, uh, businesses across the fintech landscape. The plan was to help the financial industry make use of the rapid advances in technology, such as blockchain and other IT applications, and strengthen cyber resilience. This is aiming to benefit consumers, investors, bankers, and new market players. According to the European Banking Authority, 852 new payment-related fintech companies entered the European market between 2017 and 2022. This steep increase was partly partially due to the introduction of the second payment services directive, so people might know that as PSD2, which we'll get into a little bit later, as well as Brexit relocations. Interestingly, Lithuania with 108 uh, was the leading, the leading market which saw the highest number of new entrants to in the fintech space, followed closely by the Netherlands, then Sweden, Germany and Spain. Next slide, please, Stu. Um, if you wanted to dive in a little bit to the type of licenses that were granted in that period for the 852, just as a way of um, a snapshot as to where the players are largely settling in Europe, 62% um, of those firms were granted in the payments institution authorization area. That's quite a large percentage, and it's also an area where Australia has a lot of strengths. 26% um, 26 26 were in the le electronic money institution EMI authorizations, and 12% uh, were in the account information service provider authorization space. <clears throat> So in order to give you a good view of what's happening in Europe, we wanted to pull out a few key trends that have influenced um, the fintech ecosystem over, over the past four or five years. There are a couple of others and, and maybe during question time we can dive into those other ones. But I think PSD2 is a significant one to, to put on your radar if you weren't already aware of. Um, it's a framework that enables open banking by permitting bank clients and businesses to use third party service providers to manage their finances. Now, the Australians on the line will be very familiar with open banking and our, and our consumer data right is, is, is largely to be believed to be one of the leading uh, mechanisms globally, uh, but open banking in Europe uses open API technology to enable third party service providers and banks to build new customer centric financial applications and services. 
Um, and at the same time, and this is, this is again somewhat obvious, but I'll, I'll say why I've, I've pulled it out, but bank clients here are slowly uh, having their smartphones as a centrepiece of modern living and as well as their digital banking. Now, this is uh, a point of difference to Australia, I think, and something to keep, keep front of mind that even though the PSD2 framework exists and is widely uh, rolled out, there are still a lot more hesitancies at the consumer level for engaging in open banking and in data sharing and in data, um, in data privileges being granted to third parties. So uh, while we do see it as an area of opportunity that the PSD2 framework here in Europe, there is still some, some ongoing sensitivities and some ongoing um, scoping that you might need to take into account when you're having these conversations conversations with consumers if you're B2C or, and, and also B2B when you're talking to those institutions about how they treat their consumer data. So the second uh, trend we wanted to pull out was um, to say that fueled by the pandemic and the switch to remote operations, digitization has accelerated um, in the financial and professional services sector in Europe and has created opportunities for international companies. A strong indicator to support this is the shift in venture funding, and Brendan might be able to comment uh, on this further during the panel session. But for example, during 2021, digital banks such as N26, Revolut and Bunk raised significant capital to scale up even further. This is demonstrating that VC funding flowing to digital banks is increasing heavily and can be indicative of a trend uh, for growth in those areas. And the third trend we wanted to touch on briefly, um, as it's a, also an area where Australia is emerging as a, as a capability ecosystem, a capability developing ecosystem, is that according to a new study by Chain Analysis, Europe is the world's largest crypto market with investment in decentralized finances receiving over 870 billion euros in crypto in the past year. Due to the boom in cryptocurrencies and the European Union started working on a regulation on markets in crypto assets, which is called MICA. It's currently expected that the MICA will come into force in 2022, that's this year, and will be directly applicable in all member states after an 18 month transition period. This means that a harmonized set of rules for products and services related to crypto assets can be expected throughout the European Union by 2024, Q&A section, but otherwise, Stu, could we flick to the next slide? I'm going to leverage the spotlight, given that I cover the Dutch market, to dive a little bit more deeply into the Netherlands, and then we've also um, uh, brought forward some stats around Germany for you for, in this session as well. So overall, the Netherlands is a major European hub that positions itself within, with an innovative business climate. Interestingly, uh, of those 820, 852 companies that I spoke of earlier, a large percentage of them went to the Netherlands. But of all of the companies in the Netherlands, 20% um, of the companies that established here are, are of non-European companies that are headquartered outside of the, the EU. So that's to say that 20% of all businesses in the Netherlands are actually foreign businesses. Um, and we can learn from that, that the ease of doing business and establishing here and or using the Netherlands as your base for European businesses is something that is widely accepted um, and widely practiced. One of the, a couple of the key points that make it an attractive market and maybe BART or, or, or um, or, or Ian will be able to comment on this later, but the availability of knowledge and talent here um, and the market acceptance of digital payment services and, and FinTech in general, um, make this market a really, really good one for, for FinTech companies. In the Netherlands, the top three FinTech categories, and that is the type of companies that are here as at June, 2021, um, were the first were in payments, cash management and e-commerce. That's the first categorization. Uh, the second most, prevalent companies are in investing, asset management and capital markets, and the third is in count, accounting and ERP, which is followed really closely by data, AI and software development. Um, that count at June 2021 saw um, 1,297 fintech companies in, within the uh, fintech ecosystem here in the, in the Netherlands. According to the German FinTech report, which was released in October 2021, there are currently 639 active FinTechs in Germany, um, with single service providers as the largest group with approximately 230 of those companies. Now, interestingly, in Germany, there appears to be a slight decrease um, in the startup creation statistics with an average of, of, of just close to 1% decline over the last 12 quarters. However, the highest percentage of young startups, and that's those that have less than five years maturity, is in the risk and compliance and the decentralized finance segments, which we spoke about a little earlier. Stu, we could flick to the next slide. 
on this in this uh, section, we wanted to pull out a couple of areas of opportunity and a couple of trends that might uh, lead themselves to to creation of opportunity for you guys to consider throughout your your journey to Europe. Um, but we'll start with Germany. So in Germany, digital payment usage is is heading up and up as a result of the pandemic, which creates opportunities for Australian payment companies. So according to the payment experts at Oliver Wyman, the pandemic has significantly weakened local customer reluctance to pay by contactless methods, including cards and mobile wallets. But this is just part of the current development. And anybody who has been to Germany ever will know that that reluctance was fairly widespread. Um, but the fall in cash payments is also being driven by the growth of retailers finally allowing electronic payments. And then the additional introduction of Google Pay and Apple Pay is another driver of contactless payment in that market. Um, as such, you can see that there are several trends that are finally working in tandem to reinforce that uptake and will finally make that conversation a lot easier in Germany. In the Netherlands, I thought one, one um, piece of information that would be good to, to pull out is that big players in the fintech industry are focusing on implementing ESG practices in their systems and their activities. Financial services in the Netherlands are being used as an instrument for stimulating stakeholders and third parties to pursue a sustainable pattern and to shift behaviours in the right direction. Um, the need to strengthen social and economic resilience is highly important in the market, and this is particularly true in the light of uh, post-COVID or in COVID recovery times. Um, and we have found that firms with sustainable finance um, uh, practices have been less volatile and outperform firms without sustainable strategies. I think uh, you guys will get a copy of these slides um, and you'll be able to look at a little bit more in detail about the, uh, the image that's on that slide there, which is, which is huge and overwhelming, but that is a, a, a demonstration of the Dutch FinTech ecosystem and you'll be able to dive into which sectors are, are, have the most companies and or look for some partners that might, might apply to you in those sectors. But uh, that's probably enough from me uh, and I want to dive right into the question and answer section so that we can hear from the people who have done it before or who are actively doing it or who are supporting companies doing it. Um, so uh, without further ado, I want to jump straight over to Ian and ask or and say that and advise that we'd love to hear a bit about FinPay's journey, about your story and how you came to scope the opportunities across the, the UK and the EU. Yeah, thank you, Annika. And firstly, thank you to, to Austrade and FinTech Australia for inviting me today to, to come and speak to you guys. Um, yeah, FinPay is, is obviously a Brisbane-based or Brisbane-founded company um, with, with kind of global aspirations to, to operate in many markets. Um, we identify the EU as a really exciting opportunity to, to looking back to some of Annika's sides around uh, digital, digital penetration and cash displacement um, and, and quickly observing, you know, the, the contactless payments are on the rise. Um, and, and certainly Europe presents a, a really interesting opportunity to, to harness some of that power. Um, uh, from, a, from a particular kind of go-to-market perspective, um, you know, we, we've got a, a great director, uh, Mr. Maddox Burhall, who, who pioneers and, and pushes our business and our brand um, um, in, in the Netherlands. Um, and, and thank you, Maddox. Uh, I don't know if you're, you're on today, but, but hopefully that, that will be reverberated to you. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly been an interesting opportunity to, to scope out um, and even during a pandemic. Um, we've been quite lucky uh, being digitally native that, that we've been able to set up operations and, and look to work um, with key stakeholders, investors um, and partners in the region. Um, and, and I particularly think that the Netherlands, um, Annika, to your point, um, from, a, from a talent and partner perspective is, is certainly the place to be. Thanks, Ian. And I did forget to, uh, she's gonna, gonna send me an angry message in a second, but I did forget to let everybody know that we have the chat function open on this, on this uh, panel session. So please submit your questions as they occur to you and we will go through them in a moderated way towards the end of the session. Um, but, but thanks for the, for the intro, Ian. And certainly maybe we can dive into the appointment of Maddox and the, and the, and the way that, that having someone in market or having an agent who's worked uh, in, that, in that kind of uh, space before is, has been really beneficial for FinPay. But we'll come back to that later. Um, but we wanted to jump to you and hear a little bit about uh, your experience working with Australian businesses in the Netherlands and perhaps pulling out one or two key things that Australian businesses should consider when they're opening an office and hiring their first staff in the Netherlands or elsewhere in the EU. But but we can scope it sure. in the Netherlands if that's the easier way. 
Yeah, thank you, Annika, and uh, nice to meet you all, and uh, be a pleasure to be uh, a guest on this uh, webinar, one of the speakers. Um, yes, our experience with Bridge with um, clients from Australia really kicked off when Brexit happened. And you can imagine in the past, uh, historical times, many companies, um, uh, Commonwealth, former Commonwealth countries, uh, moved to the UK to set up the base in the EU. And after Brexit, we see a quite large influx of companies from Australia uh, going to the second best option and now actually the best option here on the mainland, which is the Netherlands. Um, at Bridge, we work a lot together with the Dutch government and the Dutch government has some agencies uh, worldwide called the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agencies. They're also based in Sydney and they promote the Netherlands as a key destination for foreign direct investment, including uh, digital, uh, fintech and cybersecurity companies. So here at Bridge, since a couple of years, we're now onboarding clients, uh, mainly from uh, Sydney, Melbourne, and a few from the West Coast of Australia, um, to set up base here in the Netherlands. Most often, that is in the form of a legal entity, which we call a besloten vennootschap. It's a little bit, and you can forget about the term, but it's just a limited company with close liability. And that is most often the best vehicle to start your operations here in the Netherlands, to cover basically the whole European Union. Um, one of the largest challenges that Australian companies face here is, uh, of course, uh, the time zone, the, the, the distance. And also, if you want to become really active here in the Netherlands, um, you need some kind of substance. What we, what we often say in the Netherlands, that one of the key words is substance, um, in the, especially with fintech companies, but also tech companies uh, using a base uh, via a, a mailbox or a virtual company to, to start off the operations is most often preferred, but is not always working here on the continent. So not only in the Netherlands, but also in other countries here in mainland Europe. Um, tax authorities, banking institutions, they would like to see some substance. And that is one of the key challenges for, for companies, not only from Australia, but also from the rest of Asia Pacific, um, to see, okay, do we really can have that foothold there, have someone local running the office or send someone over from the headquarter to run the operations there? When that is fine and manageable, basically it's not that complicated at all. Uh, corporate law in the Netherlands is quite flexible. Uh, you can start with a foreign director as one of the uh, directors of the local entity. Um, you can basically do everything in English, your labor agreements, even your bookkeeping, you can keep running from out of uh, Australia. Um, one of the other challenges also is if you want to, if you need a license from the Dutch National Bank, the DNB, then you have to go through uh, a separate process which specialized niche firms can assist you with. Um, but all in all, we see that, that it's relatively easy for Australian companies to set up base here, access to human capital, ease of doing business. Everybody has some kind of, we call, we call Euro English, eh? so availability <laughs> or an ability to speak English. Uh, that's quite common. So as Annika mentioned, 20% of all companies here are, have, a, have a foreign background. Um, so please do not look at the Netherlands as your, as your, as your only market in Europe. It, you really have to see it as the gateway into Europe. Um, yeah, and then I think it can be quite successful. And then you can also spread out to other countries. So many of our clients, one of the largest markets is Germany, but they cover that from out of the Netherlands, also because of the tracks treaties uh, that are in place. So even if France, yeah, Germany, think, you can, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, I think, I think we'll, I think we can, we'll dive into the tax treaties a little bit yeah, later, because sure. I think that's actually a, a unique yeah. benefit to the Netherlands as well. Indeed. But I wanted to jump back on, on the point that you made about substance and then, and then flick yeah. to Brendan and all this is not on the list, Brendan. I wanted to, to perhaps pull out um, perhaps that, that question of substance as something being equally as important for partners here in the Netherlands, for customers here in the Netherlands and sort of ongoing um, uh, customer service uh, ability here in the Netherlands, but also from a, perhaps yeah. from a from a venture perspective and from a funding perspective, that, that dedication and that substance in a market or in a region at least is probably a factor that Brendan, you and your team look at pretty closely as well. Did you have any comments to make? Yeah, sorry. Thanks very much for the invitation. And um, I think from our perspective, yeah, there's, there's no real difference on firms coming from abroad into kind of the, the region. Um, you, you're looking for the same things from all firms. And, and one of the key things, of course, is who's behind the company? What's the team? 
um, if you're really going to expand into Europe and make that a, a big play, you know, it could be that the European side of your business is actually bigger than the Australian side of your business going further forward. So what are you going to show us as to how you're going to build that out? Uh, where's the commitment as, or the substance, as you say, uh, in terms of who are going to be the people that are going to be driving that? If it's just a mailbox, how serious really is that? Um, yeah, you're really going to have to build out kind of an infrastructure here to be able to, to cope with that. Um, so I think I'd just agree with kind of the, the previous panelists on kind of you know, where you're going on, on that side. Um, I suppose I'd just chip in for the UK at this point in time, um, even post Brexit. Um, you know, the business hasn't died here. Um, yeah, I think we're still alive and well. And certainly the funding um, from the UK perspective is, is still much larger than it is in actually other parts of Europe. Um, however, um, you know, the, the streets are not paved with gold. Um, you know, it's, it's competitive, as you would expect. Uh, and Annika, you mentioned earlier some of the, the big raises with the, the likes of Revolut, etc. Um, you know, while the numbers coming out of the UK um, look fantastic, and continue to increase. Uh, there is a bit of a 80, 20, 75, 25 sort of uh, mix there in terms of there are some very big raises. And if obviously you're not quite that big, uh, then if you're part of the, the 20%, um, yeah, that, uh, well, you, there's 20% of funding available for 80% of the companies, uh, you can imagine that uh, it's not easy to get that. So any of the issues around substance and you know, what you're doing as a team are kind of particularly important then as to how you're gonna do that. And I suppose the other issue is you know, how you're gonna set up. Are you going to be a subsidiary of uh, an Australian firm? Are you gonna set up a new firm here that's effectively utilizing sort of all the benefits of uh, the, the sort of home company uh, the, the, from a technology perspective? So it really depends, I think, on the setup as well as to how, how you're gonna look at that. Maybe it would just stay with you for a second, Brendan, then, and, and kind of ask perhaps apart from the team and kind of the tech, are there any specific um, attributes that you look for in an Australian company when they're looking to expand um, in order to kind of spark your interest? Um, and then what advice would you have for Australian companies about how to better spark the interest of a, of a, of a VC firm like Seed Capital? Yeah. Um. I think we're, you know, we're not going to treat an Australian company any differently than we would anybody else. And I don't think anybody would expect that. Um, you're going to look at the fundamentals of the company. Um, so do you actually have a solution that's going to solve a problem here? Maybe it solves a problem in Australia at the moment. Is it this case here as well? Um, if you're looking at Europe, you know, it's, although there's some commonalities uh, that are there, um, you know, it is a, a big region and there are lots of different differences uh, as to where it is you're going to be going. Uh, so have you done your research in terms of where you're going to land, how that's going to benefit you? Um, it, it could be that instead of going to the Netherlands, you may actually end up going to Ireland uh, because that would be your native English speaking sort of country and maybe would have greater similarities with respect to legal systems, etc. And still benefit from being in the EU. Um, so yeah, you know, there's various different sort of things around that. But I, I don't think yeah you know, this idea that we'd look for something specific from an Australian company that would be different than what we're looking for from somebody else uh, wouldn't really be the case. And just because we have a, a home fund uh, in Australia, uh, I don't think will will necessarily mean the European fund will be doing any favours. Uh, just to get some Australian firms <laughs> in, just ways. for the sake of it. It's, it's a competitive business. So. We don't get mates rates. Is that's what I'm hearing, Brendan. <laughs> um, Ian, we might flick back to you and kind of dive into a little bit uh, of your experience as a CEO of an Australian company that has actually registered in and is active across the EU and the UK. Um, be interested about your general experience and then diving into... Uh, any particular areas that surprised you um, about about some of your early efforts? Yeah, look, great question, Annika, and, and thank you. Um, I, I guess you know our experience in Europe has has been a 
uh, a fruitful but but labouring one. Um, uh, uh, certainly in 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 you know a post kind of pandemic world, um, running remotely while also an advantage, you know, is is sometimes a disadvantage to having yourself there um, working closely with your team. Um, you know, through uh, I guess the the improving regulatory landscape um, through the EU has has certainly been beneficial to Australian fintechs looking to explore the region um, and and certain jurisdictions. Um, you know, the the Dutch government have been uh, particularly kind of you know uh, engaging and, and supportive throughout that, uh, as well as the great people at Austrade and and fintech Australia. Um, I guess the key takeaways for us was was really about finding um, you know people that align with our business and our core values and myself as a CEO. Um, and, and, you know, again, I can, can give Maddox some kudos about uh, belief in the vision and, and really understanding and harnessing that European kind of adoption for, for technology like ours. Um, so, so that's, you know, a, a huge pat on the back for us. And, 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 you know, we're, we're really excited um, The the next kind of steps for us will be um, as our, as our solution evolves, um, you know, really keeping our ear to the ground about that regulatory and compliance piece to make sure that, that we're always staying within, within our boundary um, and, and certainly engaging with, you know, people like Bart and, and you know, associate other firms um, to, to make sure that as we expand across Europe, uh, making sure that, you know, the, the ever-evolving, you know, regulatory compliance, KYC, AML and CTF laws and regulations are always met. Um, as, as you know, it, it certainly is a core part of our business as, as we grow and expand. Thanks, Ian. And that might be a good uh, segue to ask Bart, uh, um, I guess, what can companies do ahead of uh, entering the EU market to ensure that they are compliant with local laws, fit to do business across tax um, and corporate responsibilities? And that would stand true from the first um, entree into the European market, but then also as they expand into other markets. Yeah, yeah, good questions, and uh, thank you, Ian. Um, you, you remarked it well. Um, yeah, compliance is is critical in this industry, and um, we, across Europe, still, although the European Union is is not one country with with all laws are are similar, we still see that in each country. Uh, banking law can differ, um, uh, compliance can differ, regulation can differ. Um, so if an Australian company, fintech company, is in need for a banking license or one of the, the clients in those countries request that you need to have a local entity to do business, uh, for example, many e-commerce companies, also in Germany, France, sometimes insist that you need to have a local entity, you really have to look beyond only the Netherlands if you want to set up your structure. Um, and, and consider some kind of umbrella structure that you use one country as your home base. Most often we recommend the Netherlands as a holding. And then also most likely you need for each country a small branch, a small entity to cover those local needs. Um, Bridge is not specialized in compliance and regulatory issues for the fintech, but we work together with, with niche firms that, that can assist with that, with licensing, etc., and making sure that for if there's a necessity for each local um, bank authority, you can apply for that license. To come back, to the Netherlands is most often preferred as that base to roll out operations all across Europe. Again, compliance is important. Setting up the legal entity as I mentioned before, is relatively easy. Then when that is in place, then the next step will be to go into that process of application for a license um, and regulatory issues, et cetera. Uh, but in general, setting up the legal entity itself is relatively straightforward. And you can already mention in your articles of association what kind of industry uh, you will be active, what are the objectives. So you can build it in already from the start. Um, Ample information is available from uh, government websites, uh, from the DMB, the Dutch National uh, Bank, uh, and other uh, directives, of, as Annika, she also mentioned, uh, the European Payment Service Directive too. So, um, yeah, we can assist with that. Uh, we can guide you into the direct uh, correction. And Annika, just, just further to Bart's points, I guess there's a, a very interesting focus that, that, you know, reverberates across fintech globally, right? Um, you know, fintechs in Australia have a have a succinct problem with traditional banking. Um, you know, there, there mm. seems to be a, a significant disconnect between traditional financial institutions um, and fintechs just trying to simply get an operational bank account. Um, and yeah. and you know, we we did experience those pains in the EU, and 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 you know, uh, and it's certainly something to 
to make sure that you, um, you know, pick the right banking partner or, or seek the right advice from the right people around selecting the right banking partner. Um, as you know, there there's nothing more than a bigger hindrance than trying to find a new banking partner halfway through your journey. So, you know, um, certainly reverberate what Bart says and and, and get get good advice. Um, you know, there are boots on the ground that have a wealth of experience and knowledge that can guide you. Um, and don't be shy to ask, you know, those foolish questions that may say, where do I get the best bank account or who's not going to unbank me? Um, because yeah. it's a core component of your yeah. business, particularly if you're a fintech. And I was going to jump into to challenges, but but also I was going to double down on that. I thought thought twice about it because I actually don't have the solution. But I do think that actually getting banked in the Netherlands has been a particular pain point. Um, I've recently set up Austrade here in the Netherlands, and it was something that that we struggled with and have found kind of as as a sort of barrier, and not not necessarily getting the bank account, but not being able to do anything without the bank account. Um, there are lots of Dutch processes and Dutch systems that are only open to you if you have a Dutch bank account um, or if you have a digital identity within the Netherlands for which you need to do a couple of other things. So there were some barriers for us as Austrade setting up here. Um, but having said that, once you are within the system, the system does tend to work for you quite well. But, but I was going to pull out the, the banking partner or, and or the kind of banking institutions as a, as a particular sort of um, uh, adventure, let's call it, um, to, that everybody should spend some time kind of researching quite quite deeply. We wouldn't want to, we're not going to call it an obstacle, we'll call it an adventure. Um, and Brendan, I, I, I hear what you said about Ireland and, and perhaps maybe we should loop the, the UK team in a little bit more um, next time round as a, that, that does sound like a good alternative given it's sort of the best of both worlds almost um, being so closely linked to, to the UK but also still part of the EU. But but for this for this webinar, let's focus in on on kind of the main the main continent and and Germany and the Netherlands because that's what we promised to do. Um, but there might be some interesting points to pull out about Ireland um, going forward, or if you or if you had anything else you wanted to add about it now, Brendan. No, I think um, yeah, obviously um, the Irish population in general is a much younger one. Therefore, from a talent perspective, um, I've always been much more in the financial markets. Uh, there's quite a number of the US firms that have actually entered uh, Europe, have actually ended up in Dublin. Um, so some of the proprietary trading groups, and that's largely because they could see that there's local talent that they could pick up on. Um, and you still have the benefit of the proximity of Northern Ireland. And uh, there's actually quite a, a big talent pool up in Northern Ireland as well, particularly around technology and cybersecurity, uh, where they've made a big push into those. Uh, so you kind of have that uh, quasi benefit there as well of you know, wherever you kind of place yourself that you you still have that kind of strange situation where you're in one island, but it's Ireland versus Northern Ireland. Uh, we won't go into the politics here today. So. Best not to, best not to. Yeah. Um, and, and Brendan, maybe this is kind of a little bit out of order, but perhaps I should have asked you right at the very start, but I guess we're interested in your view on the points of difference between the fintech ecosystems in Australia and in, in the UK or the EU, um, given your experience working with a number of companies in the space, is there anything that you think is worth pulling out as a key point of difference or a key um, kind of trending direction that, that might be different to what's happening in Australia? Uh, I suppose in general, the principles are the same. Um, and it would be the same anywhere, I think. It's not just Australia versus Europe, for example. Um, but I think the it's just size of market um, is kind of the key thing. Um, so it's good from one perspective. Uh, I suppose if you're investing, that you've got a, a greater amount of choice, um, but then also harder to sort the wheat from the chaff, perhaps. Um, but then on the other side, if you're coming in, um, obviously there's you know, that heightened competition. Um, and I think it depends on where you are within Europe as well. There's, there's pockets of you know, expertise, I suppose, in different areas. Uh, so from a payments point of view, Germany was mentioned earlier. Um, areas like Berlin uh, have picked up a lot you know, with respect to N26, I suppose, and sort of you know, areas like that on the, uh, the challenger bank side. Um, yeah, so I think, that, and also 
you mentioned Lithuania. Um, I think places like Lithuania, Estonia, it's just where there's just been a general acceptance of um, the ability to do everything digital, um, whether that's down to putting the ID for everybody in the country on blockchain in Estonia. Um, yeah, so yeah, they, they've kind of gone the, the extra mile, as it were, from that perspective. Uh, so you may actually find that some areas are more welcoming uh, in terms of wanting the business that much more. Um, and yeah, in the UK, of course, there's a, a big population already locally. Um, it's not so much a difference between the Australian sort of ecosystem, but uh, the UK, I suppose, has suffered a little bit after Brexit now. Um, apart from the payment licensing piece, although from what Bart was just mentioning, you, know, you could argue that if you have to set up an umbrella operation out of the Netherlands to cover all the other European countries, you could probably do the same thing from the UK uh, with you know, obviously a little bit more pain uh, to get into continental Europe now than was the case before. Uh, but talent, I suppose, is the big issue that's being focused on at the moment. Um, so. Um, the UK is going to go much more towards the point system you know, that you're familiar with in Australia. Uh, and so therefore it will be visas and how the visa situation is going to come about. So whereas before it was very easy to bring in lots of talent uh, uh, from continental Europe that wanted to come into London, um, you know, going further forward, there's questions about how easy that's going to be. Um, although, you know, there's lots of policy sort of movements to try and ensure that there's uh, visas put in place that's specifically in relation to fintech firms uh, so that yeah, you can cont continue that momentum. Um, yeah, and I think uh, just generally, if I look here um, on the news last night, we had the mayor of London actually uh, has been in New York and San Francisco just this week. Uh, and so therefore there's lots of moves to actually bring even further VC funding in. Um, and what we're seeing here in the UK, I suppose, is um, lots more US VCs coming in. Um, and uh, a large part of that, I think, is partly um, things look expensive in the US um, relative to Europe from a valuation point of view. Um, and given the strength of the dollar as well uh, that we've seen over the last couple of years, um, it's looking cheaper to actually put your money into Europe in general. Um, but of course, that doesn't necessarily mean they're just going to splash the cash on anything. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's interesting that there are, there's also a bit of FOMO now, whereas before it used to be the idea that you had to have your million pound annual recurring revenue before a lot of VCs would take a look at you. Um, some of them now, depending on certain sectors, are going earlier, particularly in digital assets. So there's, there's some FOMO out there um, with respect to the idea that they have to get in and maybe get in at an earlier seed stage on certain firms. Otherwise, they won't get a seat at the table later on because everybody will follow on because you know, it's, it's obviously a, a good company and is gonna grow. So you know, they're gonna miss out. So we're even hearing about um, you know, some US VCs giving some money to angel investors here, um, who if they get a seat at the table, if they're gonna invest, then it's kind of, well, you know, put in 50 grand for me as well. Uh, and we'll sort of put our chips across the table to a certain extent uh, and see whether um, we can do that. Now, of course, that's obviously with trusted angels who they think actually can spot the right uh, opportunities. but. So I think um, it's interesting from that funding point of view, that that's quite fluid. There's, a, there's maybe on one sense, there's always been an issue of going from seed to later stage. There seems to be a bit of a, what they call the valley of death here, that if you're, if you're not seeing traction quickly enough, it's easier to get the seed funding uh, and get up and running. Uh, but then if you don't see that traction, it's maybe harder to get the follow on. Uh, while on the other side, there's just more money coming in in general. Uh, and so therefore, depending on which sector you're in, uh, as to whether you're flavor of the month or not, and whether people are really kind of looking for, for those areas or not. Mm. So, sorry, that doesn't really... cover particularly the, the difference between the Australian ecosystem and here, but more from a general perspective. Some current trends. No, really, really interesting. And I think, I mean, the, the, the only comment I would make is, is I think if, 
if the US is looking to the to the UK and the EU as a as a jurisdiction with, um, I guess well, what I want to say, what well, I say bargains to be had. Let's say in in terms of valuations, then then I'm I'm sure Australian companies who tend to to value value even lower, even if even you know because that's the way that our ecosystem works. Perhaps that's something for them to explore as well. Is the is the foreign VC that is available in the in the UK, i.e. the US VC that's available in the UK, and or the US VC that's available in Europe as an angle for them to explore um, as well in in their kind of funding journeys. Um, but Ian, I wanted to flick back to you, and I, we've already kind of spoken about a couple of the challenges that, that you've kind of confronted, you know, keeping across regulations and um, and and the getting the right banking partner. But perhaps if we could hone in on um, some of the challenges or some of the lessons you learned as it relates to your customer acquisition journey across the EU, that would be uh, probably really interesting for our companies on the line. Yeah, no, really, really thank you, Annika. And I guess our, our kind of, I suppose our acquisition strategy is, is very different to, to a, a traditional kind of, you know, consumer focused fintech product. Um, we, we sit very much on the mer merchant focused side of the, of the financial services or fintech sector, um, where we're built on a simple premise of, of merchant acceptance and payments acceptance across digital ecosystems. Um, so that's acquiring payments for for other payment service providers, QR wallets, buy now, pay later providers and, and cryptocurrency exchanges for more mainstream payments products. So from, from our perspective, it's really about understanding, I suppose, the traditional cost to acquire for those, those partners in market um, and, and effectively utilizing a, a subset of kind of marketing services that they already provide to capture and, and harness the merchant base that they may be um, struggling to attain. Um, so I guess, you know, for... For the European market, it's a really exciting ecosystem. Um, it's always evolving and ever growing, uh, particularly from a from a payment service provider kind of opportunity. Um, you know, you only have to look at the likes of kind of Klarna and what they've achieved, um, and and the success story that they are, and, and the likes of Molly and and those types of guys. You know, in, in that ecosystem. So, so for a fintech like ours, we like to to strike those kind of strategic partnerships to to broaden the horizons of of us coming into the region. Um, you know, the, the other, I guess, you know, and you touched on our, our kind of hindrances and, and you touched on, and a number of people have touched on talent. Um, you know, I, I guess just, just diving back to that because that, that's obviously a, a really strong pain point of ours. Um, and, you know, the, the country is very focused on tech companies, which is in the region, which is, which is really great. Um, but subsequently that's kind of created a large gap between developers who, you know, are, are available and, and the great, you know, the greater kind of need, right? Um, and this all also applies to, to, you know, many other positions within businesses because it's, it's reverberating through the entire kind of business unit or, or, or silos that, that we operate, um, and especially in FinTech nonetheless, um, which in turn, you know, obviously pushes up salaries um, and, and, you know, it can potentially make it very difficult for, for smaller startups or, or companies that are, you know, potentially looking to raise capital and, and trying to adjust their valuations and their business economics and, and, and understand the region a lot, you know, in a lot more holistic view. Um, you know, salaries in Australia are high and, and I think it's the world over for tech talent at the moment. Um, but, you know, you really need to do an accurate market assessment of what your kind of expenditure, expenditure is gonna be. And, and no doubt people like Brendan like to, to look at the, 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 you know, the unit economics and really understand how, what, what's your path to get there and how you're gonna acquire talent in the region, right? Um, because Having a bunch of Australian developers working in a different time code can lead to some cranky engineers long term. I, I wouldn't suggest that. Yeah, no. Well, those of us who uh, uh, always work across jurisdictions can uh, speak to the uh, the kind of baseline crankiness that exists. It's a lot of, a lot of um, in a day. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, now, I thanks, Ian. Thanks for that. I promised Bart that we would come back to a particular point that I think he wants to make around um, the specific taxation agreements or the taxation benefits between the, the Netherlands and Australia. And Stu, I think I think that's Bart's slide seventeen. If we jump to that, um, and so and so, Bart, over to you to to have a bit of a discussion around that um, as a particular point of of interest. Yes, thank you, Annika. Yeah, Stuart, I guess slide number 17, let me check. And where do we have it in front of me also? Uh, uh, 15, apologies. Stuart, uh, yeah, that's the one. 
Yes, thank you. Well, as Brendan also mentioned, and, and, and I also referred to it earlier, um, the Netherlands is, is, is well known for um, financial tax structures using a Dutch holding, which can be used as a vehicle for your European or even worldwide operation. Uh, I don't want to dive completely in this slide because then we, we need a lot more time to, to, to discuss it, but I just want to give you the take home message. So what you can see here is what we see most often for our clients, um, also from Australia, but also from other destinations, of course, that the Australian parent company is incorporating a wholly owned Dutch holding company. And the Dutch holding company is actually a passive company. There is no staff in it, uh, no operations, and so on. The only purpose this Dutch holding company has is to hold the shares of the underlying operating companies. So in this example, you can see a Dutch holding company is owning a 100% operating company. And what you can see in the Dutch operating company, it can be a fintech company, but it can also be another company. There the operations are run. So people on the payroll, uh, marketing, sales, uh, purchasing, and so on. On that operating level, there is the compulsory corporate income tax payable. The advantage of what we have in the Netherlands of the tax structure is what we call the participation e exemption, is that any profit that wants to be dividended up to the Dutch holding will be taxed at 0%. In the end, if you want to dividend up or uh, make an, an, um, a transfer of, the, of that funds to the Australian parent company, then you have to look at the tax treaty. And at the moment, dividends are taxed maximum 15% and interest and royalty maximum 10%. What we see in practice is that most of our clients keep the profits, retained earnings in the holding structure and use that for further investments across Europe or other destinations. So if we go from top to down, Australia Limited, Dutch holding, Dutch operating company, that is how it's most often set up in the beginning. When clients see that business is getting off in Germany, in Italy, and so on, they set up under that Dutch holding structure, a new operating company that basically the same rules will apply for the Dutch operating company. So you pay local corporate income tax, any profit remaining can be dividended up at 0% to the Dutch holding structure. Um, some basic information about tax rates in the Netherlands. We have up to the first 395,000 net profit, there is a 15%, so 1,5% of corporate income tax. And anything above the 395,000 euro is taxed at 25.8%. Uh, um, we see that many clients like the structure. Um, it is It helps them to well, um, ease in the tax structure and also limit their liabilities. Um, we see that clients like it when they want to sell one of the operating companies, it does not uh, influence the other operating companies. Um, so this is a an, an structure most often used by our international clients that say, okay, want to use the Netherlands as a base and, and use it for expansion uh, across Europe. Um, yeah, that's basically in a nutshell. I'm not sure if there are any questions about this because I can imagine some people would like to, to study it more in detail, but I think for most people with experience in setting up a legal entity have, have a, I think, a, a good idea what I'm talking about. And Bart, we could we can flick this one slide to them as well afterwards, if is that all right with yeah, you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah sure. Great. Yeah, okay. no problem. Perfect. Um, <laughs> So I think I wanted to round out maybe with, oh, actually, let's let's go to Stu for a second. I think there's a couple or at least one or two questions that have come through on the line, and then we'll do one final wrap-up question for everybody at the end. Thanks so much, Annika, and thanks everyone um, for your for your comments and thoughts so far. It's been it's been awesome. Uh, we do have one question, and this was previously touched on in the discussion, but Terry uh, Yell has asked if uh, if the issue of debanking is prevalent in countries other than Australia. Um, so we know it's here in Australia, we discussed that a little bit, um, but does it happen over in the EU? Does it happen in the Netherlands, elsewhere? Maybe we'll start with, with BART, if possible. Sorry, and what was the question? Debanking? De Debanking. Um, so when you, you lose access to your, to your bank accounts oh, you know, from a company yeah. level? Yeah. Um, 
that happens occasionally and especially if we if you have a, a local entity in the Netherlands and there will be an, a change in directorship and one of the directors is resigning in uh, a country that is on the sanction list or is red flagged um, then it occasionally happens um, in general when you're in the system you are in as long as you stay compliant and make sure you do everything according to the rules. Um, what we see with, with some of our clients and they just change the directorship without informing us or without informing the banks. And then automatically the system is built in in the Netherlands with the, the, the trade register. But if it's changed in directorship, all relevant parties will be notified. And then, yeah, they will start again doing the due diligence and what's going on and, and uh, you know, uh, would we like to have this uh, as, as yeah, from the speaking out from, from the bank as uh, that is going on with a client? Um, and we see sometimes in change of ownership also that the banks will reconsider uh, do we want to still have this company as our client in the in the new structure as it's now uh, as it now is, is in place? So occasionally it happens. Yeah, not so often, but for those reasons, that's what, what we see in our experience. Thanks for that. Part. That's really I hope that jump in. And Ian's got his hand up. Yes, thank you. I'm going to anecdotally say yes, Stu. It's happened in every single jurisdiction that we have launched our product in because we go directly against the incumbents. Um, yeah. it, it, it is just a fact and a force of nature that financial institutions have still not come around that fintechs are there to enable or help with products um, and, and user experience and speed and facilitation of of better services for, for not only the consumers, but their merchants, but perhaps the bank as a whole. Um, they see us as a threat and they will, will continue to see us as a threat. Um, and and I, you know, I don't know how you change that stigma, which is unfortunate because I think if, if true, true you know, financial services innovation is to happen, um, I think we kind of need to you know, not hold hands and, and you know, hug and kiss each other, but we need to be understanding and supportive of each other's ecosystems and, and, and bridge that gap um, because, you know, while you've been able to open a bank account, I guarantee at some stages there will be a risk or compliance person that will look at your business and they won't understand what you're doing. They'll look at it from a traditional conventional sense and they'll flag it and you'll be shut down without a reason. And the fallback that they always go to is you've breached our terms and conditions. You can't, you're not able to speak to anyone. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's a rat race, but eventually you find a bank that will support you. It's just about to, to, you know, reaching out to the people that are there on the ground, Austrades, the Barts of the world, and, and, you know, the investors like Brendan to go, well, who do I talk to? Where do I go? How can you help? And getting that knowledge firsthand. So that that might point. come back to, I guess, the, the, the final question I wanted to ask everybody, but Ian, maybe you just double down on it. There is what's kind of the, the one piece of advice that you would give an Australian fintech looking to, to enter the, the EU market. And, and I don't want to steal it, Ian, but would yours probably be make sure you find the right banking partner. Um, I, I feel free to, I, to say something else. Yeah, I think finding the right banking partner and finding yourself a Maddox. We've been incredibly lucky to, to find great talent um, and, and great directors in, in, in country um, and, and provide us a wealth of experience and knowledge and, and you know, not only across tech, but, but other kind of services and, and markets that we've, we're, we're operating in. So um, I think it's just really about doing your homework, like really, really assess the market, do your research, do your understanding. You know, Austrade and Fintech Australia are there as resources for Australian fintechs looking to expand. Um, use them, use them to your advantage. Overuse them I, I, is my is my piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> Great, we might temper that a little, but no, 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 no. We are here. Well, that's what that's what we're here for. We're here to help. Um, uh, Brendan, over to you. Do you have a, a one kind of piece of advice that you'd want to make sure everybody hears? Yeah, no, I think um, from the regulatory infrastructure perspective, the guys have obviously covered that. Um, yeah, I think it's a case of also using the local uh, agencies. So, um, yeah, Austrade. Uh, and FinTech Australia, I'm sure, through the FinTech Bridge to the UK, uh, have relationships with DIT, with Innovate Finance, Tech Nation. If you're coming into London, London and Partners is another group that um, actually is doing a lot of work. So really try and utilise as much as possible you know, as part of the research that Ian's talking about. Uh, use those entities as much as possible because they all have foreign direct investment arms. 
So therefore he could use them to actually get a huge amount of free advice uh, before you have to start paying people for it. Um, yeah, so I think that'd be the, the, the key sort of thing from that perspective. And then maybe over to you, Bart, is maybe, and without, I don't want to steal it, but is it, you know, sometimes you might need to pay for advice and we're here yeah, to help. Yeah. So there are people yeah. who are experts. Correct, correct. Thank you, Annika. Now, I totally agree. And, and of course, we, we love to onboard new clients from Australia, but I also want to stress, reach out first to the information that is already available. Yeah? Our trade has a lot of knowledge. Uh, the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, they have a, a, a special team focused on fintech, bringing in fintech companies. They can also supply you with a lot of info. So try to gather as much as possible information, which is readily available online with agencies like Allstreet, NFEA. Um, yeah, and for the, the actual rework, as we say it, hey, setting up a legal entity, uh, when someone comes over, like a labor agreement, immigration, yeah, then you really need to go to a commercial service provider that will guide you smoothly through all those processes. Uh, but in the beginning, in the first initial stages, um, a lot of information is available. Many others have, have gone through the same challenges uh, as, as you might have. So use that experience. And um, yeah, and when the moment is there to say, okay, we really want to take that next step, set up a legal entity and be present uh, either in the Netherlands or in the UK, reach out to a reliable service provider uh, known in the network and that can guide you smoothly through, uh, through all the processes. That is my uh, take home message. Yes. Great. Well, I, I actually I don't think there's a, a better way to wrap and I'm watching the, the clock stay below 900. So uh, at, at that, we'll, we'll call it a day and I'll say thank you to each of the, the panel members, Ian, Brendan and Bart, for taking time this morning or this afternoon to, to talk to us all. Um, for those of you who have colleagues who've missed this um, session, we are recording it. So we'll be sending it out to everybody who RSVP'd and it will also be made available on FinTech Australia's YouTube channel. Um, and then if there are questions following on from the webinar, please reach out to Stu in the first instance and he can help direct it uh, to, to one of us or to a, a different Australia office um, across the globe. So thanks everybody for taking the time and thanks again to the panel for, for joining us this morning. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Take Thank care. you all. Thank you all. Have a fine day. Bye. Thanks so much everyone. Bye-bye.